Hi there, and welcome to Telefunkian. In today's video, we're going to discuss the maintenance of the Vintage Sequential Circuits Pro One Analog Monophonic Synthesizer. If you have a Pro One, or are thinking about buying one, or are simply interested in vintage synthesizers, this video is for you. I'd break the maintenance of a Pro One into six main elements. The first, maintaining the keyboard, is covered in considerable detail in another video on the channel. We'll cover the next four elements in today's installment, and leave the last one, calibration and tuning, for a subsequent video. Cleaning a Pro One is pretty straightforward, though I'll share a few tips with you in a moment. Recapping vintage synthesizers is pretty standard fare, and as we've covered in some of our other videos, there are plenty of good reasons to replace the aluminum electrolytic capacitors in 40-year-old gear, especially if it hasn't been used in a long time, as electrolytics can go bad from disuse. In addition to aluminum electrolytics, the Pro One contains a number of tantalum capacitors, which are famous for their rather spectacular catastrophic failures in which they quite literally go up in flames. There are some who advocate wholesale replacement of tantalum capacitors with aluminum electrolytics, but tantalum capacitors have some properties, including their very low equivalent series resistance, that make them ideal for certain applications. So we'll be refreshing the tantalum capacitors in this instrument with new ones that are a bit larger and have higher voltage ratings than the original ones, hopefully ensuring another 40 years of service. The use of electrolytic capacitors in the Pro One is refreshingly sparing, especially when compared to contemporaneous Roland products, for example. The main ones we'll concern ourselves with are the reservoir capacitors in the power supply. The originals are long-life Elnas, rated at 25 volts, rather too close for comfort, in my opinion, to the 22 or so volts they see in regular service. We'll upgrade these with long-life Nichicons with a higher voltage rating. The power supply is also where the tantalums are hiding, with one filtering each of the four voltage rails in the Pro One. There are only five more electrolytics in the Pro One. One is attached to the reset pin on the 8021 CPU, and three are used in the noise generation and external audio in section. One is used to couple the reverse bias 2N4250 transistor that generates noise, while two more are used in an anti-parallel series configuration to provide a high-pass filter to the 5532 preamp. The use of two capacitors in this way is functionally equivalent to a single bipolar or nonpolar electrolytic at half the capacitance. Presumably such things were relatively rare in 1980, and Sequential elected to use two regular electrolytics instead. My assumption is that this filtering arrangement is used as insurance to protect the rest of the instrument from any craziness that the user might decide to inject through the external audio input or might be generated by Q103. The last electrolytic is on the output of the voltage controlled filter. This is the only one of the bunch that I would suggest matters in terms of the audio quality. So if you're going to splurge for audio grade electrolytics, this is the place to spend that extra 50 cents. So in summary, we have seven aluminum electrolytics and four tantalum capacitors to replace in the Pro One. We have to remember that when the Pro One was designed, circa 1980, the world was a much quieter place, at least with respect to the electromagnetic spectrum. In the intervening years, we've seen the rather ubiquitous adoption of technologies such as switch mode power supplies, wireless technologies, and others that make for a much less hospitable environment for our electronic musical instruments. With this in mind, we're going to take a look at the power supply in the Pro One and see if we can detect any contamination of the power supply and whether it might benefit from some additional filtering. There's a lot written on this subject and plenty of discussion online and elsewhere. We don't have time to get into the theory in today's video, but we'll do a few experiments in an attempt to convince ourselves that if anything, our additional interventions are unlikely to do harm. Finally, the icing on the cake will be fitting the Pro One with new side cheeks and badges, as the originals are a bit worse for wear. I've purchased some nice new side cheeks from Mint Synth and reproduction badges from Analog US. I want to mention them and give them a shout out as being part of the community of vendors and enthusiasts that help keep these instruments alive. So without further ado, let's get started. I thought I would uh, show you uh, one of the things that I'm going to do before I begin really cleaning the switches. Uh, I'm going to do sort of a surface clean of the instrument. And <clears throat> this instrument was uh, in California in sort of a desert environment for a number of years. And that has resulted in the accumulation of a fine sort of dust. And this is uh, embedded in some of the switches and the like. And um, there might be a, a, a temptation maybe to start spraying contact cleaner around these switches. But what I'm afraid of is if I do that, 
uh, I'm going to end up simply creating a mud that then becomes more difficult to get rid of. And so what I'd like to do is get rid of this dust first. So this is where having a, uh, an air compressor comes in handy. And I've got an air compressor, it's at about 100 PSI. And so I'm going to blow this dust off of these switches. And it even requires a little bit of encouragement and that will be provided in the form of a, a paintbrush that I have here. So I think you get the general idea. Uh, that way you can get rid of uh, most of the debris before you actually start applying contact cleaner, which is really going to attract some of that and make it more difficult to get rid of. So hope that's helpful. I have the Pro One set up here on the bench and it's powered up and it is actually uh, at the moment connected to an amplifier which allows us to hear it. And it's just playing a, uh, a sequence through the arpeggiator. And this is without the keyboard connected. And this is one of the wonderful things about the Pro One is that uh, you can actually run the instrument without the keyboard connected and get some sounds out of it. The reason why uh, I wanna hear what's going on is because I am in the process of cleaning the switches and about to clean the potentiometers. I've cleaned all of the switches with this product, Deoxit D5, which is pretty well known. Uh, not the cheapest contact cleaner. I, I started out with uh, this contact cleaner, which is a little less expensive. Um, so about half the price, in fact. And uh, I started off with that and Q-tips, getting them in and under the switches as much as possible. And then the final cleaning was with the Deoxid D5, the more expensive product. And I'm about to uh, attempt to clean some of the potentiometers. And one of the reasons why, well, you know what a scratchy potentiometer sounds like. Sounds like. Oh yeah, there we go. All that, those scratchy noises, that's the sort of thing we want to get rid of. And so I'm about to uh, attempt to clean these. And the way that I'm going to do it is I'm going to use a, a different product. And this is one that um, is a little gentler on the carbon tracks of potentiometers. It's Deoxit Fader F5. And this is covered in a, a video by another YouTuber who points out the fact that these potentiometers have a nice little opening here and you can squirt a little bit of uh, lubricant into that opening and away you go. Um, the, the nozzle on the deoxid is actually a little too large for this purpose. And what I've done is I've stuck a, a syringe that I've taken the sharp tip off and I've uh, filed it so that it's not going to damage anything that it comes into contact with. And that is uh, more or less ready to go. <clears throat> now, you don't wanna be getting these types of cleaners all over the board. Uh, and so again, another tip from this fellow YouTuber is to take a, a piece of uh, paper towel or something of that nature and uh, make a little cutout protecting the rest of the board from any overspray that might occur. And if I can get this right in here, uh, we'll listen to what's going on. And I'll turn down the other oscillator. So, so indeed, we're just listening to this one. There's a very healthy squirt and a little bit of overspray, but not too bad. And then we can uh, simply take our knob and move that pot around several times, get it nice and clean and lubricated. And 
And some potentiometers won't really respond to this. You'll find that they, they end up having dead spots. Um, that's a really kind of a terminal ailment. And uh, if, if that happens, what we need to do then is desolder it, uh, disassemble it and attempt to repair it. Uh, but we'll do this first and see uh, where it takes us and go from there. This seems pretty clean. I don't uh, hear any noise. So that would be that would be success in my books. And so I will move this little indicator tape. This tape is marking the ones that have proven to be noisy and uh, move on to the next one and go from there. I'll just do one more uh, just as an illustration. Oops, wrong, wrong chemical. And although you can you can bend this nozzle. If you, if you attempt to squirt it with the nozzle pointing down, you're actually not going to get the material through the nozzle. And so you wanna make sure that as you're squirting it, it's actually straight. Or at least straight with respect to, um, with respect to the bottle. So this isn't rocket scientist, science, it's not uh, brain surgery, nor is it rocket surgery. Uh, so it doesn't take too terribly much. If you uh, don't have success with your first attempt, you can try it one or two more times with this Deoxit F5. I wouldn't recommend using Deoxit uh, 100. If this doesn't work, I'd just say take the potentiometer apart and start cleaning with isopropanol only. Let's see, we appear to have now a noise free potentiometer. So that's another one. All right, I'll move on. Well, we're connected to the negative five volt rail on the power supply of the Pro One. And we're monitoring this with my uh, digital multimeter and it's measuring negative 4.9 volts, which is probably just fine. Uh, and we're also monitoring it using the digital oscilloscope. And uh, using this approach, we can see the AC noise that might still be present on the DC regulated uh, supply. And the AC noise appears to be on the order of maybe seven millivolts RMS, which is not fantastic, uh, but it's not terrible. And there doesn't look to be too much uh, periodic information in the noise that we're able to monitor. And so again, that's probably a good sign that the power supply is functioning as it should and is being properly regulated, which is not necessarily guaranteed given that uh, these regulators themselves are about 40 years old, as are the tantalum capacitors, which are filtering the output of the regulators. If we move over to the positive supply, we have 4.93 volts. And the signal on the oscilloscope, which I'm going to stop appears to have a little bit more uh, periodic information in it. And in fact, we can see a, uh, a spike which occurs in the negative direction. Again, this is the positive voltage rail. And we're just looking at the AC ripple on this. We can see a bit of a spike that is periodic and it occurs roughly every uh, 10 microseconds or so. 
And so this would have a, a frequency of 100 kilohertz, roughly. This isn't something that any of us could hear, um, but it is curious to me that we are able to measure this. And it's the kind of thing that's not appearing on any of the other supplies. And so I wanted to explore whether or not we can get rid of this uh, little bit of noise on the supply. This is probably more of an academic exercise. I'm not sure that this amount of noise is going to disrupt any of the functions in the instrument in any kind of material way. But nonetheless, wouldn't it be nice to be able to get rid of this? And just by way of comparison, I'm going to uh, move over to the other supply rails and very gently uh, attempt to, without shorting anything, connect to the negative 15. And here we can see the negative 15. And we have a little bit of uh, ripple there as well, um, or rather periodic information. I, I, I seem to detect something that's going on about every, say, 12 uh, microseconds or so. There's a little bit of a spike there. And so that's not pure noise. Uh, there's, there's something specific going on there on the negative 15. And here on the positive 15 rail, again, I'll run this. And again, we see a little bit of a, a little bit of a spike there. And again, maybe, maybe 12 microseconds is, is, uh, the, the period of, of this spike. And so it, seems to be affecting not only the five volt rail, but the, the 15 volt rail as well. So let's explore this power supply in a little bit more detail. Uh, what have we done here um, thus far? Well, I have replaced the main filter capacitors, which are filtering the DC rectified voltage that comes out of this bridge rectifier these have been changed, so these are absolutely fresh. There's a filter cap on the um, output of the 15 volt rail, and I've changed that from a 2.2 microfarad tantalum capacitor, which is still present there on the negative 15 volt rail, changed it for a fresh electrolytic capacitor. And yet still we seem to have these types of symptoms. Uh, is this just an artifact due to the noise that exists in and around my bench? Or has this got something specific to do with this instrument, whatever else is going on on the PCB? Or uh, are these old voltage regulators ready to give up the ghost? We'll see. So let's explore how this uh, power supply works in a little bit more detail. And in particular, I want to look at the filter capacitors on the output of these regulators, because these tantalums are again about 40 years old. They deserve to be replaced. The, the question might be, what's the best replacement for them? Is it new tantalum capacitors, which have a much lower ESR equivalent series resistance than these electrolytic capacitors that I'm contemplating using? Um, or should we be using electrolytics? Should we be using electrolytics in combination perhaps with a ceramic capacitor that will have an ultra low ESR? Let's do a couple of experiments and see what we can see. What we have here is a little bit of a mess, uh, but uh, let me try and explain it to you. Um, we have a, uh, a voltage regulator a 7805, which is a five volt voltage regulator set up here on a, a breadboard. And the breadboard is being supplied by benchtop power supply. And the power supply is giving us 24.3 volts. And we're drawing 41 milliamps across this 120 ohm resistor, uh, which is coming across the five volt power supply, positive five volts, regulated again by the 7805. And we're monitoring the output with our digital oscilloscope. And uh, 
we can see that we have a little bit of noise on the power supply. There's no capacitor on the output of this power supply at the moment. Let's take a quick look at the, uh, actually the input. And you can see this is the extent of the noise on the 24 volts or so that's coming into the power supply. And there's quite a bit of chalk there. And <clears throat> we've got uh, a good uh, uh, 40 millivolts peak to peak of noise in there. And we obviously don't want that on the output of our power supply. And our 7805 is really pretty darn effective in terms of uh, eliminating or reducing a lot of this noise. So what we're looking at right now is the background noise with the power supply actually off. But if I turn it on, we can see a fair amount of noise there. If we insert a tantalum capacitor, this is a 3.3 microfarad tantalum across the power supply. Let's see what happens with this noise. It's really quite substantially reduced it, hasn't it? What if we use a larger tantalum capacitor? Quite a substantial reduction. What if we use a capacitor it's much, much smaller. This is a 0.1 microfarad capacitor, but in this case, this is a ceramic disc capacitor. Again, substantial reduction. What about a 10 microfarad electrolytic capacitor? What about a 100 microfarad electrolytic? I believe that the lowest noise we're going to get will be with a combination of low ESR capacitors of reasonably high and low value and that would be this combination here, which would be the tantalum capacitor coupled with the ceramic disc capacitor. And so this is the combination that I'm going to be using in the power supply for the Pro One. That's the noise in the system with the power supply off and with the power supply on. So almost uh, immeasurable using the tools that I have at my disposal. So since this uh, part of the power supply, the five volt rail is giving us a bit of noise, um, I'm going to change this capacitor first and uh, maybe beef it up with a slightly larger one, a 10 microfarad capacitor, and uh, put a ceramic on it as well. And then we'll see how much noise there is on this uh, part of the power supply. And if that doesn't fix it, we'll replace the regulator. And if, if it still doesn't fix it, um, it would suggest that there's some sort of crosstalk between some of the other components that are using the five volt rail. Uh, which could include the CPU of various other parts of the instrument. And uh, we can try to track down and uh, maybe ameliorate that issue uh, when the time comes. So uh, I've sparked up the soldering iron and uh, we'll uh, set about to attempt to desolder this. And here you can see the uh, wonderful uh, backside of this PCB and it's a glorious, rather glorious, I think, um, solder masking, which is, is pretty unique, I think. It's this weird kind of fleckly 
or crinkly uh, paint. So I am so darn old school. Uh, here I go, I'm gonna uh, actually be desoldering this uh, using solder wick. And you'll notice these little beads here on a number of the components in, uh, in the, the Pro One. And at first I thought, well, these must be some sort of ferrite bead that's there uh, to cut down on RF that might be affecting the instrument. Um, but I, I've attempted to measure them and they're not ferrite. I think they're just plastic beads. And all, all I can uh, conclude is that they're an attempt to ensure that when you're soldering in a, a component like this one, that might have paint on the legs. And this is a two-sided board. When you're soldering in a component like this, you're not attempting to solder on the top surface in a part of the component that is uh, has the leads covered with paint or, or whatever the component is dipped in. So that's my interpretation. Um, regardless, I'm going to be uh, re reusing these beads just to make the, sure that they uh, remain with the instrument and we don't uh, inadvertently lose them. <clears throat> so this is a tantalum capacitor and it is polarized, of course. Longest lead is positive and there's a little uh, plus sign here on the uh, capacitor as well, indicating the polarity. And so we ensure that we're putting it in in the correct polarity. And it, the polarity is correctly indicated on the PCB. I'm going to bend this a little just to ensure that um, it's going to clear. It needs to be a little lower than this potential potentiometer uh, in order to mount properly. So this is the, uh, this is the power supply now with the capacitor replaced and we're looking at the five volt rail again and we can see uh, we haven't done anything much to uh, to improve the situation. Although curiously, we seem to have a, now a spike on the positive side that is a bit bigger than the one on the negative side. But regardless, there's still uh, this periodic noise that's coming through. And this now leads me to suspect that it's more than just the capacitor. It might be this uh, regulator. Again, it could be another component on the board that's using the five volt rail that is feeding back into the supply um, but we'll replace the regulator and see what happens one of these days i'm gonna repair my denon solder sucker but i do prefer to use uh, solder work on these old boards There we are. It wasn't glued on, but there may have been some compound or something that's dried out over the years and just become so hard that that wasn't gonna come off. So I'll try and clean this up. So here we have a brand spanking new 7805 and need to bend the legs, hold them, bend them.
a little bit of uh, thermal compound here on the back side of our regulator to facilitate heat transfer. So there's our 7805 plugged in, and uh, we appear to have cleaned it up a little bit, but not a lot. We still have this little uh, uh, negative going spike about every uh, 10 microseconds or so, so about 100 kilohertz. Uh, I don't like that. I'd like to get rid of that, um, but it's not coming from the power supply per se. So we'll just uh, leave well enough alone there and maybe think about um, replacing some of the capacitors on some of the devices that are using uh, this rail, uh, the positive five volts. <clears throat> Alrighty. In the meantime, we'll move on to replace the other tantalum capacitors in the power supply because those are, are really quite old and deserve to be replaced. And we will uh, turn this guy over, plug it in and uh, measure the power. Okay, so this is very clean. This is our 15 volt rail. And we'll just move over. This should be, this is 7905. This will be our negative five volt rail. And it is, it is quite clean, but we see a hint of this uh, little spike every 10 microseconds or so on there. Again, this is our positive 15. And we see quite a bit of a spike there. Maybe that's coming from our CPU or something. Uh, and then this is our uh, positive 15 volt rail. And we see again, a little hint of this uh, spike every few microseconds. So I think that's about that. Um, we can now uh, move on. All the potentiometers are clean. All of the circuits are working. Uh, all the electrolytic or and or tantalum capacitors have been replaced. So we're very near the point where we can button this guy up and, uh, and see how she plays. Well, I'm about to put the keyboard back in this Pro 1 and I thought maybe I would just spend a moment talking about the wiring of the power supply. And I mentioned in another video that there was some, I, well, I had some issues with the way the power supply was wired. Uh, the way it was wired was such that the neutral went through the fuse and the hot went through the switch. And so um, that's just backwards. Uh, well, not backwards, but rather not best practice. The best practice is that the hot line, uh, which is the black here, comes into the fuse, out of the fuse, into the switch, and then to the transformer. So the transformer only sees power 
when the fuse is good and the switch is on. Uh, we have a ground that comes and is mounted on a, a lug, which is in the chassis. And unlike ARP, who seem to love to paint and get paint everywhere on the inside of their instruments, uh, sequential circuits um, blocked off certain areas on the chassis uh, to enable good grounding. And so there's a lug here with a ground, and then there's a, uh, a lug that goes to the um, PCB, uh, which is also at the same ground, and the transformer is grounded at the same spot as well. So all three are tied here. So sort of a star ground system. And that should give us uh, noise-free operation. Replace this, the fuse uh, holder, uh, which has writing on the top, has to go top, otherwise the panel on the opposite side that secures the fuse in place uh, will be upside down. Um, <clears throat> and this is the panel, this little red element that uh, is somewhat prone to getting lost, but these can still be found. Um, they're still manufactured. In fact, this replacement uh, came from Mauser and they're reasonably priced. I think it's about six bucks. Um, put in a new power cord and uh, a grommet. And I also um, did punch a hole through the chassis to put a strain relief here. So this power cord if I yank on it really hard, I could probably swing the instrument around my head without uh, doing too much uh, damage to the inside of the instrument um, with respect to the power cord. And uh, that's about it. So quick update before I secure the keyboard. Well, the Pro One is in great shape. Everything's working properly. And there's a few last minute uh, cosmetic enhancements we would like to make before we uh, button this up and consider it done. Uh, you'll see that currently it does not have the side cheeks mounted on the synthesizer and these are they. Uh, the side cheeks are in reasonable condition. I've seen much worse. They're a little dirty. There's nicks and scratches. Um, one of the things I wanted to explore was whether or not we could uh, acquire new side cheeks in much better condition. And indeed, uh, I was able to find some for sale in the United Kingdom. And uh, <clears throat> these are them. These are brand new side cheeks purchased off of eBay. You can see that they're nicely wrapped, protecting one another from scratches. And they're in pretty much beautiful shape. That's one. And this is the other. So, they're obviously a little different, and that's because they're a different kind of wood. Uh, my understanding is this is a, a much harder wood. They're, the color is a little different and so on and so forth. I'm not going to get rid of the originals. Uh, I just wanted to try these out. So I'll, I'll mount them and see, see how, uh, how they look and go from there. In the meantime as well, you may have noticed that the badges on this Pro One are a little, let's say, worse for wear. And so similarly, I've managed to acquire uh, replacement badges, brand new, and uh, I'll be installing these after I get the old ones off. So there are two badges in question. The Pro One badge that goes on the top surface and the sequential circuits badge that goes on the front of the synthesizer. I'll give you a quick view of the badge on the front. There's a view of the badge on the front. It's in better shape than the 
the badge on top, but still it has a little bit of damage. So before we take these off, what I'm going to do is put a little masking tape around the badge so that it's obvious exactly where it goes. Um, because I don't want to be having to guess after the fact, after we get the badge off. Uh, this may also protect the plastic from any scratches that may be introduced in my attempts to remove this badge. Do the same on the front. Now, usually the best thing to use when attempting to remove plastic or, or rather metal from plastic is plastic. And uh, I have a number of plastic tools that I've held on to uh, that are designed for taking apart cell phones and, and the like. And they include these little devices, which are almost like guitar picks, which are great for getting underneath a flat surface and separating uh, materials that are held on by various types of adhesives. <coughs> so it does indeed look like this is doing the trick. could be expedited by using a little heat, uh, such as from a hairdryer or even a, a hot air station. So this is a, an approach that is proving to be more challenging uh, than it could be. Uh, so I've got a, another tool, a metal tool here, uh, and I can just use a lot of mechanical force here, or uh, I can bring out the heavy artillery. And what I've got here is my hot air gun, uh, which I use for rework. And I'll just use it to heat this gently and uh, see if that helps facilitate the removal. And so I want to be pretty careful. Uh, I've got this turned down. It's at 150 degrees Celsius. And so this is a temperature uh, that should be reasonably well tolerated. Of course, this is doing a great job of removing the masking tape as well. There we go. Yeah, so the old badge is stuck on with something that might be some kind of contact cement, some sort of adhesive. Uh, you might be able to see all the dings and scratches that were in it. 
uh, although now it's a little more bent up even than it was. But our new badge will look just great. I'll clean this off a little bit. But uh, this one will go on here and it sticks on with adhesive that is uh, on the badge. Just use the same approach to get off the other badge. On the front, I'll spare you the details of that. So this is the Pro One all finished and it looks beautiful. It plays perfectly well and sounds great as well. Uh, but I thought I'd just give a quick uh, tour of the instrument uh, before I, I move it over to the studio. Uh, so this is it with its new badge and a new badge on the, the front as well. And uh, it's all cleaned up and all the knobs are put back where they're supposed to be. All the potentiometers are lubricated. Uh, and it's a generally a, a thing of beauty, I'd say. It's in fantastic shape now.